All right, um, I'm just going to give you a very quick introduction to Mathematica, the things you'll, the, the basic things you'll need to know for this course. Know that there is lots of information online. If you ever get stuck, just Google, all right? Okay, so when you first open Mathematica, you get a screen that looks something like this. Usually what you want to do is just click on Notebook and open up a new notebook. A notebook is where you do all of your work in Mathematica. All right, so when you get your notebook, you can type whatever you want, right? Um, I'm just going to show you some basic things you can do. If you want to add two numbers, just type what you want to add, you know, 1 plus 4. If I hit Enter, nothing happens because Mathematica is just thinking I'm going to write more stuff on another line. So to actually execute something in Mathematica, you hold down Shift and then hit Enter. Um, you can open Mathematica now and give that a try, right? If I want to take the difference between things, 7.5, 7.4, all right, I hit Shift Enter and it calculates the difference. If I want to multiply things, three times four, Shift Enter. If I want to divide, I use the slash, 12 divided by 7.2, 12 divided by nine. All right, okay, now notice one thing that happened there. When I told it 12 divided by 7.2, it gave me a decimal answer, but when I did 12 divided by nine, it gave me a fraction. So Mathematica, when it saw that I divided by 7.2, it said, look, you're already doing decimal stuff. Let's just roll with that, all right? But when I did 12 divided by 9, Mathematica realized that if it did decimal stuff, it would lose information. It would lose precision. So Mathematica tries to keep things um, kind of algebraic as much as possible, not plugging numbers in and converting things to decimals, all right? So 17 divided by 3, right, it's going to give me a fraction, and it's going to try and hold on to that. If I wanted to, um, oh, no, one thing you can notice, you can use your cursor or your mouse, and you can go up to something and go to another, a place where you've been before and um, reevaluate that. If I wanted to give me a decimal, I could just make one of them a decimal so that I've already kind of told Mathematica I've thrown information away and then it'll give me the decimal. But if I come back up here, get rid of the decimal, the point is Mathematica is going to try and keep things as precise as it can whenever possible. Okay, so that's how you execute things. Those are your basic operators. Oh, also raising things to a power. Four squared, I use the up caret. Four, that means four to the second power, all right? Um, seven cubed looks like this. Seven point one cubed looks like that, all right? Okay, now the next thing I'm going to show you is variables, all right? Oftentimes you want to store things away for later use. So the way you make a variable is you just choose a name for a variable like a, and then say equals, a equals 7, all right? Then whenever I hit a and execute it, I get 7. I could do a equals b times 7. And when I hit a, it gives me 7 times b. B is an undefined variable. It doesn't know what B is, so it just holds on to it, all right? And when I say A, it just returns 7 times B. Now, if I come along and say B is equal to 4, now what's A equal to? Now A is equal to 28. It's 7 times 4, right? Because now it knows what B is, all right? Um, next, we're going to talk about functions, all right? So Mathematica has a lot of built-in functions. If I wanted to take the square root of 4, that's just 4 to the 0.5 power, right? There it is, too. But Mathematica also has a built-in square root function, SQRT, right? Now, Mathematica uses square brackets for arguments to functions. So I put a square bracket for close square bracket, and, and that says 4 is the thing I'm sending to that function. I hold down Shift and hit Enter, and it says 2, all right? Why would I want to use square root when I could have just did to the point 0.5. Well, for one thing, you notice that there's no decimal point. That decimal point says Mathematica is thinking about this as a decimal, whereas here it's like, no, dude, this is really 2. This isn't 2.000001, and I lost that 01 because I rounded. That's really 2. Now, I haven't tried this, but I can probably do a similar thing just by saying 4 raised to the 1 half power. Okay, so that works as well. Square is just another way of doing the same thing. Notice parentheses. All right, if I did 4 to the 1 over 2, what is the precedent? 
I don't know. What's it, what's which what's, what's, what is it going to do first? If you ever wondered, is it going to do four to the one power and then divide that by two? This is a very bad example because they get the same result either way. But let's try and take the square root of eight, right? I don't get the square root of eight. I get eight to the first power divided by two, right? So the parentheses says, do this operation first. All right. Notice, Mathematica is trying to keep precision. So instead of calculating a decimal number, it returns to root two, all right? And if I do square root of seven, right? That's irrational, it's going to leave it as square root of seven, okay? What if I actually wanted to know the numerical value of square root of seven? Well, one thing I could do, as I mentioned, is I can come and I can put a decimal point in there, and then it knows you wanna do that, all right? Another thing, though, you can do, if I switch this back, Mathematica has a built-in function, n, and n just turn something into a decimal. So if I operate on that with the n function, it'll give me a decimal. n can actually take more than one input, all right? The first input is the thing you want to turn into a decimal. The second one is the number of digits you want to keep, all right? So I can choose how many digits I want to keep in this calculation with the n function. All right, another nice function, sine. All right, so if I take the sine of seven, there. It just gives me the sine of seven back, right? Because it doesn't want to lose precision. So it's just going to keep it as the sine of seven. But if I do n sine of seven, it'll turn that into a decimal place, a decimal. Cosine is another function, 1.7. There's the cosine of 1.7. All right, there's a whole bunch of different functions built into Mathematica. You can, if you're looking for one, tangent, right? That's tan 2.2, .2. all right? If you're looking for a function, just Google it or use help. Mathematica has help, and you can search for different functions. All right? Okay. Now, what if you want to define a function of your own? That'd be really handy. I have some function I want to define. The way you define a function is you just say the name of your function. Let's say I'm going to define a function called blurg. There's my function. And then in the square brackets, I'm going to tell it what variables blurg, this function blurg, takes. And let's say it takes a variable x. So I type x, and then I type an underscore. And that's saying, this is the variable I'm going to use in blurg. And then I can set this equal to whatever. So maybe blurg is going to be sine of x plus x squared. There we go. There's blurg. Now I can take blurg of 4. There it is. I can take blurg of y. And there it is, all right? You can define uh, functions that have more than one variable. So I could define uh, gonk. That's my vari that's my function. And maybe it's a function of two parameters, x and y. So I just put a comma between them, the underscore after them. And then I define my function. And maybe gonk is equal to x squared plus y cubed. All right? And then I can take gonk, evaluate gonk at 4. That's what that is equal to. Whoops. I called it gong. My function is gonk. So now it evaluates gonk at 4. All right. Um, why is it? Oh. I evaluated gonk at 4. It just returned gonk at 4 because it's like, I don't know a function named gonk that only takes one variable. So it's like, whatever. But remember, gonk takes two variables. There we go. So I can evaluate gonk at 4 and 5 at 4 and b. Remember, I defined b earlier so it knows what number that is. I've never defined c. So it's just going to plug c in as a variable, all right? So that's how you make your own functions. The next thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to plot things. It's really useful in this class. If you get some answer to a problem, you want to see you know, how do things change as I change something, plotting is a great way to build intuition. The way you plot is with a function called plot, all right? The first thing you send to that function is the thing you want to plot. So maybe you want to plot sine of x, all right? Then you put a comma. The next thing you give it is the range that you want this variable to change over in your plot. So what you do is you open a curly bracket. You give the variable that you're plotting over. That's your dependent variable. Then you give it a range. Let's let x go from minus 1 to 1. Close curly bracket. Then I close my square bracket to close plot. When I hit shift enter, I get sine plotted for minus 1 to 1. Or maybe I want to plot for minus 10 to 10. There we go. All right. Um, sometimes plot, yeah, okay, that's all I'm going to tell you about, well, no, I'm going to tell you one more thing about plot. You can plot multiple functions by putting your list of functions in curly brackets. So 
that does, I put my sign in curly brackets, that didn't do anything, but now I can put a comma and I can put another function in here. Now I can plot both of them at once. I can also, you know, add a third function, maybe blurg of x, right? And here's blurg of x. Whoop. I can see what that looks like. Okay, and I'm going to add another function. Let's add gonk. Gonk takes two variables, so let's just set the first one to four, and let's see how it changes when I change the second one. And there's gonk plotted with its first parameter at four, and then changing the second parameter from minus ten to ten. All right, so there's my plot. So that's how you plot things. Okay, now. Um, it turns out that Mathematica has some built-in constants which are really nice. One of those is pi. So if I enter pi, I get pi. If I want to know what pi is as a number, I use my n function, right? There's pi as a number. Oh, we need more digits than that. You need at least 100 digits of pi if you want to feel smart, right? So um, another one is e, all right? If I enter e, what's the numerical value of e? That's just the natural number, right? 2.71, blah, blah, blah. It turns out Mathematica has a built-in function exp, which just is e raised to some power. So e raised to the negative 5, all right, is the same as e raised to the negative 5, all right? So the function just does the same thing. And if I put in 0, .0, it'll give me a number. If I put in 0.0, it gives me a number, all right? Um, okay, so there's a bunch of variables. Uh, you can look into them, you can Google, see what variables, or sorry, what constants are defined in Mathematica. A nice thing to be able to do in Mathematica is integration. So if I want to integrate something, I use the integrate function, integrate. All right, open my bracket. And the first, it takes multiple arguments. The first argument is the thing that I want to integrate. So maybe I want to integrate x squared. The next argument you give it is the thing that you want to integrate with respect to. That would be x here, right? So this will give me the integral of x squared with respect to x. And of course, we know that's x cubed over 3, all right? Now, if I want to do, that's an indefinite integral. If I want to do a definite integral, I just put this x here in curly brackets, and I give the range. Let's integrate from 0 to 1, all right? And then it gives me the definite integral integrated from 0 to 1. So if I just put x in there, it gives me the indefinite integral. If I do curly brackets and give it the start and end, it'll calculate the definite integral, right? And I can integrate crazy things. Sine of x squared. What's the integral of sine of x squared? We do that. Ah, I don't have to go and look stuff up in a table anymore because Mathematica will tell me what the integral of the sine of x squared is, right? And if I want to do a definite integral and actually plug in numbers, I can do that, or maybe I can integrate from 0 to pi. Ta-da! That's how you integrate. Now, um, I'm doing a definite integral, right? Let's say I integrate from 0 to 1. Um, the way Mathematica does this is it does things algebraically and then plugs the numbers in, right? So if I put a 1.0 here, it would probably evaluate that sign, right, and actually give me a number. But maybe Mathematica runs into some trouble and it's just not able to integrate what you give it. It's just, it just can't figure it out. You can tell Mathematica, hey, you know what? I don't care about the algebra. I just want the numerical answer at the end. So don't try and figure out what the integral of this function is and then plug the numbers in. Just use a numerical technique to find the integral. To do that, you use the function n integrate. All right, and then it'll do it numerically. Whoops sine of x, we'll do the same integral here, and we should get the same thing, except when this first one, Mathematica is actually finding the algebra, figuring out what the integral of sine of x squared is, and then plugging the limits in, whereas n integrate, it's just saying, look, I don't care about the algebra, I'm just going to numerically calculate what this integral is. So if I change this to 1, right, it gives me that. Here, if I change this to 1, it's always going to give me a number because it's doing the integral numerically, all right? There's integrals. What about derivatives? Well, you can take a derivative of a function. Let's see, we made this function gonk, right? Was this the one we did of two variables? This is, yeah, so gonk of x and y. What was the one we did of, let's make a new function. Let's make a new function f. f of x is equal to x cubed, all right? So f of 4, right? f of g h, okay, h cubed. If I want to take the derivative of this function, I just put a 
prime there, right? I just put an apostrophe. So f prime of x is 3x squared, right? It just took the derivative. f double prime is going to be the second derivative, okay? So that's one way to do a derivative in Mathematica is you define a function and then you put however many uh, apostrophes, right, to get the derivative that you want, okay? But there are problems with doing it that way. First of all, I have to define a function, right? What if I wanted to take the derivative of sine squared of x, right? I'd have to define a function and then do that. So uh, Mathematica also gives you another way to do a derivative. There's a d function where I give the thing I want to take the derivative of. So let's say I wanted to take the derivative of sine squared of x, comma, then the thing I want to take the derivative with respect to. There it is. All right, I can do simple stuff like derivative of x cubed like we did before with respect to x, okay? Another reason that the d want, might want to use the d function instead of the prime is if you want to take a derivative of a function of multiple variables. So let's say derivative of sine of x squared plus y squared, all right? And let's say I want to take the derivative with respect to x, right? So the d function lets me indicate what I want to take the derivative with respect to. So there we go, all right? I could also take the derivative with respect to y, okay? Another cool thing you can do with the derivative is you can take higher order derivatives. So like I could take the derivative of x to the fourth with respect to x. What if I wanted to take the second derivative? Well, I could take that and then take the derivative of it again, but that would be annoying. So instead, I'm going to put x in curly brackets with which power I wanted to take. So that takes the second derivative, there's the third derivative, and so forth, all right? Or I could take the derivative of something with two variables, x, see, x squared times y squared, take the derivative with respect to x, all right? Here's the second derivative with respect to x, right? Okay, one thing I can do is I can, with this d function, I can take derivatives of multiple things. So this right here says, here's the function I'm going to take a derivative of. Then I give a comma, and then I say, take the second x derivative, and then take the y derivative, right? So I could do this. I could take the x derivative, then the y derivative, and then take another x derivative, right? Okay. And then I can say, after you take the second, take a derivative with x, then take a derivative with y, then let's take the second derivative with respect to x. And then I get zero, all right? So that's how you do derivatives in Mathematica, all right? I'm going to show you now how to find where a function is equal to a value. Say you wanted to find where a function crosses 0 or where a function is equal to 1. So use a function called find root. All right? So what I do in find root is I give it an equation, all right? So to give it an equation, I'm going to say x squared is equal to but this is going to be a problem if I do this because the equal sign means assign a value. It's going to try to assign x squared to be equal to 2. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to give it a function it can look at. So the way you do that is you write two equal signs. So equals equals 2. So x squared equals equals 2 tells that this is a function. And you're going to look at this function. And you're going to find where, by root, it means find where it's equal to 0. So I give it this function. It's going to try and find where that function is equal to 0. But this function could have multiple variables in it, so I'm going to tell it which variable to adjust to try and set it equal to zero. All right, so I can do that. Boom. And it says, um, whoops, made a mistake here. Find root doesn't do this algebraically. It's not trying to solve the function. It's just plugging numbers in. It's a numerical function. And so I have to, to make this numerical function thing work right, I have to tell it where to start looking. So I tell it, Find the root as you adjust x and start looking near x equals 0. And it goes through and it says, oh, um, I found a root at x equals 0. Boop. Okay. But it also gave me an error, right? x squared equals 2. That's not true at x equals 0. So it didn't find the right root, but it gives me an error. It says, this, my numerical technique had some problems and things didn't work. Try perturbing the initial point. So it's saying, look, you know, try a different place to start looking. So if I change that from 0 to 1, then it's like, okay, this time it worked. And it tells me that x is e that this, is, this equation is true when x is equal to this. All right? So that's how find root works. I can solve 
Um, for example, I could say, where is sine of x equal to 0? Oh, sine is protected. It's because I forgot I only had one equal sign, all right? So sine of x equals equals 0. And it'll find. It says, oh, it's equal to 0, right? But if I start searching sine of x is equal to 0 multiple places, it just found one. I told it, start looking at 1, and it found one, found one at 0. But I know there's other places where it's equal to 0. I happen to know that there's one near 3, all right? Oh, so if I change until it start looking near 3, it finds a different place where that equation is true. Now, we know that that's true at pi. Why didn't it just find pi? Why did it give me this number if Mathematica is always trying to keep things as accurate as possible? Because find root is a numerical function, all right? So it didn't solve it algebraically. It solved it numerically and just iteratively found, boy, at this number, 3.14159, that's where this was really close to 0. Okay, now what if you wanted to find an extremum? Well, an extremum is where a function where its derivative is equal to zero. So I can find an extremum just by saying, I'm gonna find some function f of x, and that's equal to sine of x, all right? Now let's find where the derivative of that equals zero. And it's like, oh, singular point, not happy. Let's try starting not at zero. Let's try starting at one. Ah, and it found that the derivative of sine of x is equal to zero at pi over two, right? And so that's where it found a maximum. It found an extremum of our function. All right, one more thing I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna sh a couple more things here. Sum, sum is a nice function. Sum just takes the sum of something, right? So I can say the sum of n from open brackets, n equals zero to five. All right, and it's just like adds up, all right? What if I just put the sum over n, but I don't give it limits? All right, um, does something weird. Okay, um, let's do something. Let's do sum of one over n squared, all right? From n equals one to 10, all right? It goes and it finds that, all right? What if I go from 0 to 10? It's going to go, oh, no, that didn't work because my first argument, my, my first term of my sum was, sum was 1 over 0, which is infinity, right? And it tells us your answer is infinity. All right, but I can put more and more terms in here. I can go up to sum up 100. Notice it doesn't give me a nice decimal answer. It gives me this fraction. It's trying to keep things as accurate as it, as it can be. So if I wanted to, um, I could put my n function in here and evaluate this, all right? But instead of going up here and putting, you know, this all on, okay, let's just do this. I can put the whole thing in this n function, right, which will turn it into a decimal. But let's say I just did a big calculation, all right? And I get this result, and I'm like, I want to take that result and do something with it now. Um, there's this cute little thing in Mathematica. If you just put percent and hit enter, it returns the last output that you got. So let's say I just did this big sum. Let's sum up to 200, and I get this big, huge thing. And I'm like, oh, I really wanted a decimal value. Let's just take the numerical version, the decimal version of the last thing I just calculated. And there you go. That's what the percent is good for. So if I hit 5, and then I hit percent, it's just the last thing that came out. Now if I come up here and evaluate this, now we get five, right? Because the last thing I calculated, even though this weird big number is right before this line, the last thing I calculated was down here. So one thing to worry about in Mathematica is if you go and you come up and evaluate something out of order, it remembers what you did before. It, it, it does things in the order you execute them, not the order that they are listed on your uh, notebook, okay? All right, and um, yeah, one, o one more thing. I get, let's go up to my sum here. Sum from n equals 1 to 200. Let's actually sum up to infinity. Mathematica has a constant for infinity. If I sum to infinity, boom. Mathematica is not, sum is not just a numerical function, right? It's actually trying to figure out what is the sum equal to. And Mathematica is smart enough to say, oh, if I sum up to infinity, 
this thing actually converges to something reasonable and it gives that to you. What if I take the sum of 1 over n? Boom! Sum does not converge and so it just returns, hey, I can't tell you what that sum is. It, it blows up to infinity. What if I wanted the sum of 1 over n cubed? That one confer converges and it turns out that the answer is the zeta function. So it returns the zeta function. Sum of n to the fourth power, pi to the fourth over 90. Okay. So that's a basic introduction to Mathematica. Mathematica has lots of weird subtleties. If something doesn't work the way you think it should, get on Google, look around, all right? And it has all kinds of crazy, powerful things it can do. This is just an introduction of things that will be useful for this class. Um, you'll learn more about Mathematica in a future course, and there's lots of tutorials and information that you can find by Googling online.